Hey friends, Dennis Ernst here, your personal phlebotomy guru. Hey, have you ever been mistaken for someone else? Well, I have, and it was hilarious. I've got to tell you about it at the end of this video, but right now I want to get serious with you because there's nothing funny about patients being misidentified. My goal in this video is to prevent you from ever drawing blood from the wrong patient. I'm going to do that by giving you one simple rule that will make it virtually impossible. Why? Well, because not only can the consequences be catastrophic for the patient, that's reason enough, but you, as a person responsible, will have to live with the consequences your mistake have on the patient and all the angst and regret that goes with it. I simply can't let that happen to you, not as long as I can help it. I think the best way to launch into this subject is to take a look at a brief clip from our video, Basic Venipuncture. Then we'll come back and elaborate. Your full name for me, please. Joseph Wayne Peel. And can you spell your first and last name for me? J-O-S-E-P-H-P-E-E-L-E. -E -E -E. And can you give me your date of birth? Notice how the phlebotomist asked the patient to state his full name and birth date and spell his first and last name. Many patients have similar sounding names. That's why simply asking them to confirm the name you verbalize is not sufficient. For patients who are unconscious, sedated, cognitively impaired, or have other communication or language barriers, a family member, friend, or another caregiver who is familiar with the patient must be asked to provide the same information on the patient's behalf. When a third party identifies the patient, the standards require we document the name of the identifier. Any discrepancy must be resolved and corrected prior to sample collection. Failing to follow the standardized protocol for identifying patients can be catastrophic for the patient. Studies show over 7% of wristbands are either missing or contain erroneous information about the patient. 160,000 adverse patient events occur each year in the U.S. because of patient or specimen identification errors involving the laboratory. 11% of all transfusion deaths occur as a result of the phlebotomist not properly identifying the patient or mislabeling the tube of blood. So could it be any plainer? The patient provides their full name and birth date, spells their first and last names, you compare it with the information you were provided and their ID band if they have one, and only if it's attached to them. All inpatients must have an ID band unless they're exempt by facility policy. For example, in psych wards or in patients in isolation. The standards require it. Well, it's optional for outpatients, but I'm seeing more and more facilities putting bands on all patients, in and out. Wherever there is an ID band, it must be attached to their person. If it's present, but not attached, like placed on a bed rail or setting on the bedside table, it cannot be used as a valid form of identification. And the patient cannot be drawn until the ID band is affixed. If the facility does not put ID bands on their outpatients, well then the patient must provide an alternative form of identification bearing their patient-specific identifier required by the facility, preferably a photo ID. Now, for the one simple rule I promise that will prevent you from ever drawing the wrong patient, here's how you make sure it's never possible for you to misidentify a patient, ever. That is to make no exceptions for anyone, not under any circumstances, not even if the patient is a friend of yours, a coworker, even your mother or spouse. No exceptions. Let me tell you why that works. If you were to graph every patient you draw on any given day according to how familiar you are with them, total strangers on one side, people you know very well on the other, and everyone else in between with whom you have some familiarity, maybe they're regulars, maybe you drew them yesterday or the day before, you're never going to misidentify those over here, those who you do know, and you're never going to mistake those who you don't know because you're going to go through the proper protocol for all of them. It's these right here, these right in the middle that you might think you know without checking. They're at the greatest risk of you making an exception, trusting your judgment. But if you apply the standards uniformly to everyone, no matter if they're strangers or your next door neighbor, nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets misidentified and you don't spend the rest of your life living with the remorse, regret, and responsibility for whatever consequences your exceptions caused, including death. 
Oh, sure, it might feel funny asking your mother for her name and birth date, but look, your friends know and your family knows that you work in healthcare. They know you have rules that you have to follow. Don't show them you make exceptions for some people. It isn't worth the risk that you'll make it for someone you shouldn't. Okay, before I tell you my own personal story of being misidentified, don't forget to click on the subscribe button in the lower right corner of the screen, and then click on the notification bell once you're taken to our channel's homepage so that you're notified every time I post something new. Oh, and by the way, if you want the standards we've been talking about, they're published by the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI, and they're available on their website, www.clsi.org. And for about the same price on our site, phlebotomy.com, you're looking for document GP33, Accuracy in Patient and Sample Identification. So here's my personal story of being misidentified. Back in the day, I know I don't look like the type, but I probably went to 10 or 12 Metallica concerts. I, I know, I know. Imagine me, a headbanger, right? Well, it wasn't so much the music, but my best friend's brother was the bass player. But anyways, uh, we went to a lot of Metallica concerts all over the country. And uh, uh, we, I remember going to one of them in this, we we're roped off in the VIP section in, in the middle of, a, of, of an auditorium. Uh, and uh, I could tell somebody was staring at me. You know how when somebody's staring at you, you, you just kind of tell? Out of the corner of my eye, I could tell. So I, I kind of turned and squared to this guy and a big smile came across his face and, and our eyes met and he, he says, I know who you are. And I, I said, what? He says, I know who you are. You're downtown Bruno. And I said, Down, what? I'm, I'm who? He says, yeah, I've seen you on Saturday morning wrestling, WWF. You're downtown Bruno. <laughs> I had never heard of downtown Bruno. <laughs> Me? A, a WWF figure? <laughs> Come on. Well, I shook his hand and I think I made his night and I just went on and, well, I'll be darned if, if not a month later, I'm, my son's watching TV Saturday morning, right? And WWF is on. I walk past the TV and there's my dead ringer. There's downtown Bruno. I thought, that's amazing. So I got the, got the camera out and I took a picture of it. Here's, here's the picture of downtown Bruno here. And so I thought that was great. Uh, you know, I, I, I met my doppelganger and uh, now life can continue. <laughs> well, guess what? About two months after that, WWF is coming to Louisville, Kentucky, which wasn't far from where we were living at the time. And I said, hey, Michael, we got to go. And so I dressed up like downtown Bruno and my son and I went to this WWF event. I shook hands and signed, <laughs> I shook hands and signed autographs all night long. It was glorious. I had a just, I had a blast. And I'm sure my son, poor Michael, was just embarrassed out of his skin. But, oh, there's people yelling from the bleachers. Hey, downtown Bruno. I go, hey, how you doing? And people come up and shake my hand and put their kids on my lap and take their picture, beg me for backstage passes. It was glorious. It was a glorious night of impersonation. <laughs> well, that's how I was misidentified. And I, I certainly never want to be misidentified as a patient. So uh, please do take these tips uh, on how to properly identify patients. You know, someday and maybe soon, you will be finding yourself in a position where you have the opportunity to draw a conclusion you shouldn't draw, to make an assumption you shouldn't make. Remember that one golden rule of patient identification. This will prevent you from ever misidentifying anyone, and that is what? Make no exceptions, not for anyone or under any circumstances. Feel free to share this video on social media and where you work. If you want to learn more about properly labeling the samples you draw after you've properly identified the patient, then click on this video link at the end of our visit. Remember, you're the patient's last line of defense against medical mistakes, and they're counting on you not to make exceptions when you identify them. That's today's tip from your personal phlebotomy guru. I'm Dennis Ernst reminding you to keep sticking to the standards.